Hello, everybody, and welcome back still with an episode of Conscious Aging, or let's say uh, Aftermath of Conscious Living, Conscious Dying, the series we did in November. We had planned the panel with Jane, who is today my guest, and other three ladies uh, to meet again and talk about how it was for us this uh, experience we had when we accompanied um, a dying person, that was the topic then. And we were talking more about, you know, the accompaniment of these people who were dying and we helped them. But now we wanted to, with a distance of almost half a year, we wanted to see how we are going along with this topic. And Today I'm alone with Jane because she cannot make it for the live event, but we will post this recording together with the live event, which is called Getting Older and Integrating the Challenging Experience. Because this time we are doing this in the Conscious Aging series and it's not all about death, you know. <laughs> it's about uh, how we are getting on and we have a certain age now too. So. Jane came up with for today uh, a title which we want to talk about is life changes when you face the end of it and it's exactly what is really still on my mind because as you know Mark died it's now nine months ago mm. and I'm feeling that's yeah still quite challenging but first to, to you Jane uh, would you like to introduce yourself because not everybody would have uh, listened or watched the no. episodes we did with you in November, but also a year ago we did another. Okay. The Mac was still alive. <laughs> so. Yeah, gosh, yeah. <laughs> Oof, it feels like another life in a way. So um, I just had a lovely flash there of viewing you and him and his lovely smile on the screen together. It was really nice. Yeah, I'm Jane Duncan Rogers and I am the founder of the social enterprise Before I Go Solutions and what we do is we help people make good end of life plans. But seven years ago when my husband had just died, I was, was very far away indeed from doing anything at all like this and I could never have imagined that I would be... Um, now running a, a completely different business from what I was doing at the time. Um, I had been working as a counsellor and a small business coach and I did carry on eventually continuing to do that after my husband died in 2011. He died of cancer and um, I did know that I would always write about it and because I had been writing a blog and I love to write, you know, I've been writing in a journal since I was 20. So it was normal and natural for me to do that. And about three years later, I published a book called Gifted by Grief, the title of which I can say, you know, if somebody had told me that title just after he had died, I would have not wanted to know at all. <laughs> because right at the beginning, there's, you don't feel like there's a gift. There's not a gift in it, it's horrible. When somebody close to you dies, that's just the fact. Um, I did think, I, I think I knew in theory that there might be some gift there that I would find one day, but I wasn't interested in finding it. I just wanted him to come back. Anyway, I did know that eventually I would probably write about it and I did do that. And it was the res reader's response to that book that allowed me to, um, well, that encouraged me really to set up what eventually became Before I Go Solutions. and. And it was basically, I'd asked him a few questions about what he wanted at the end of his life and what he wanted after he had died in terms of um, his body, like how he wanted it to be dressed and things like that. Really difficult questions to ask someone when you know that they're coming towards the end of their life. But the answers that he gave me then were really helpful for me later on. And um, when I discovered that other people thought that it was a really good idea that they should prepare in this way that's really what sparked um what I, what we now do which is providing courses and training and uh, products for, to help people do this because the fact is nobody despite the um the saying life changes when you face the end of it nobody really wants to face the end of it you know 
Exactly. And that makes it more difficult. That's the trouble. It makes it more difficult. So I'm kind of, I'm on a mission really to help people face the end of it and in a very practical way so that it will, is beneficial to us now, to, to you now, um, while you're still alive, but also to your family afterwards, after you've gone. And, and you know about this, Heidi, don't you? Because you know, that's how we met. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I actually, I almost have completed the course <laughs> which we did <laughs> with well you. Done. And I really realized that it is important because nobody knows anything uh, except me. This big house here, yeah, I've began to write about the water supply and other things and I will do photos and, and because otherwise it's, it's, it's really difficult. It was difficult for me to set everything up, but it's only me knowing. In the case of Mark, it was not so difficult because he didn't have a lot of, of stuff. He came yeah. when he came over from America with one suitcase <laughs> and that was all. So it was relatively easy and we had already the preparation by you. So uh, that was good. Um, but in a, in a case when you have a property and a lot of stuff in the house, I began to give away books and give away other, other stuff. So slowly, yeah. not all at once, but slowly I'm doing that because I came into the understanding that's just not kind for the people who you leave behind or who have to, to take off the clutter. And then also the idea that somebody is just throwing away your stuff which was dear to you so it's better that you throw it away yeah. and not somebody else you know absolutely because really sadly i you know i hear a lot of stories from people and one of the most common is that the people who are left behind after somebody has died almost always will just chuck stuff out especially if there's a lot of it um and maybe, you know, you say you don't care about that because you'll be dead and it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But actually, um, when you take a little bit more time to think about it and how you might want your life to have meant something to the younger generation or to your friends or whatever, then, you know, it's really, it is, as you say, very kind to go through the stuff. But also you might find some beautiful things or beautiful words or whatever it is that you would like to leave as a legacy. And that can be very, very meaningful for those left behind, yeah. Yeah, and it comes to my mind, I start with my sister, a series about growing up in post-war Germany, because I realized that nobody knows anything about uh, these times anymore. And my parents, our parents didn't tell us how it was before the war and in the war and so on. And we still, with this wonderful technology, we have the possibility to leave uh, a, a legacy behind. And that's not so much about me or her. It's just about telling people from our experience the stories of the times which are incredible. Nobody can and ever more imagine that um, my mother had to go down into the cellar, three staircases down, and heat the water for the washing and wash the things down there and then the the, the wet uh, um, washing was carried about 300 meters in the garden and wow. uh, hung up because the garden was separate from the house yeah so nobody thinks about that and that's not long ago i mean yeah. really not today everything is easy you know and so yeah. It's really good to hear those kinds of stories because it puts our life right now in context and it's the stories that people want to know about. So one of the things that I always say to people is if you're going to leave behind something or a precious object or a photograph or um, and particularly in these days of digital photographs, you know, lots of people have those, but they don't necessarily have the stories that go with them. But actually, it's the stories that make the object of the photograph. It, you might as well not bother unless you associate the, the stories with them. So... For example, if you had um, a photograph of your, your mum, she might not have been doing anything with washing, but that would be a story associated with her. And people can then, and that then brings her to life, even though she's been dead quite a long time, probably. Yeah. 
Oh, I have to figure that out for the for the video. I haven't thought about that, but I wanted to say in this context, you in your course, you gave us the suggestion to leave a legacy for a, a person you have lost. And I have done that for Mark. I was about three months. And um, let me see if I, I, I can give you the link. Uh, it's on iStore, uh, iTunes Store. It is... Uh, HTTP at W, uh, how is it, colon, slash, slash, mm -hmm. bit dot li, at B -I -T dot L Y slash Mark Book together, but Mark Big Letter, Mark Book. Yeah. That's uh, the iBook. And then there is also a PDF that's also bit.ly Mark PDF. PDF is downloadable, but the, the iBook is nicer. And it costs a little bit, I think, $1 or something. It's really not, I haven't seen any money yet from that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's only to have it there uh, in, in an official pub publishing, yeah. you know, that's why yeah. I uploaded it there. And it, I found it really very important to do that to write a story about our past and about what I perceived was his past. And mm -hmm. I invited people to give um, testimonies and pictures were together with them. And uh, also his, his daughter came after he died, unfortunately. And uh, I wrote a story about that. And so it, it feels like having created something so the person is not completely gone. I mean, it's, uh, it's digital, it's not a book. So uh, it might be as soon as something happens, it might be gone anyway, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, but uh, it's interesting, though, that because there you are, there's a, 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 an actual thing, an object, or something that you can hold on to, something that you can read. But my guess is, is that the creation of that for you was incredibly healing. Is that right? It was um, important for the um, grief process mm. at the beginning because I saw again all these pictures and I could write the story. And I also cried often, but it was at the same time a sort of structure of my time. Yeah. I yeah. had something to do which I found important. Yeah. Because otherwise you feel fall uh, easily into a hole. Yeah. And so... Um, that, that was very important for me. But then when it, it was finished, we had the series together and the series was finished. I felt that um, then I tried, I thought after that I would go over into normal life. Now it's the griefing, it's, it's enough, you know, after all these months. <laughs> And I found that really was not, it sort of started really to catch me. Mm. You know, I still continued with the shows about other topics, mm -hmm. but uh, that sort of kept me going and my animals kept me going, mm -hmm. who had all sorts of challenges. But um, I didn't expect that, you know, that the rational mind is not as potent as you would think. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So what do you actually mean by that? Just say that so I, I'm not making yeah. a function. Rational mind in the thing, sense that, okay, now you have grieved and yeah, you miss him and everything, but that's enough now. You know, you should, <laughs> you should, uh, you know, come out of that. You should, you, you are adult and you knew it before he would die. And it, even when he was in the dying process and it was very difficult, you thought, oh, ho hopefully it doesn't take too long. Because it was really also very, you know, uh, yeah. challenging. And you knew it. And then, eh, you know, yeah. it's the, so the, the rational mind thinks that um, the emotional body which we have could be guided by his ideas. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very interesting because I had a very similar experience in that um, I think I felt shocked for quite a long time probably most of that first year shocked that it had happened and I knew it was going to happen you know we had we were lucky some might say that we had a year together 14 months together before he actually died for about half of that time we actually knew yes it was going to happen much sooner than we had thought um, and and I was with him when he died and I still felt shocked. I still was in a place of, I can't believe this. Has it happened? You know, and, um, 
that went on for much longer than I would have imagined. Um, but actually, this leads me into something that I thought I really wanted to say something about this, because one of the things that I, I also had this thing of, come on, Jane, stop being ridiculous. You know, you knew it was going to happen. You've had enough time now. You yes. need to get back on board and do things and all that kind of stuff. There's some, there's something, there's some element of truth in that because life does go on and you do need to find a way to go on. Um, but what I've also learned is that for some people, it takes a very long time for them to come to a place where they are um, leading a, a different kind of life. It is, it's not ever going to go back to how it was. It's a different kind of life, but it feels like a, a bearable kind of life or even better than that. And for some, and for other people, it takes a, a very, a much shorter amount of time. And, and actually, if we can lift our judgment from that, there's nothing wrong with either of them. And the reason that I say that is because I'm now with a new partner. And when I met him, his, he had, his wife had died and it was only like about six months previously. And when I first heard that, I was horrified <laughs> because I, am, I, I remembered myself six months in and I was, you know, not coping very well. It looked like I was on the outside, but I didn't feel like I was on the inside. And, um, but um, my partner, Ian, was, he, he had somehow managed to process it in a different way from me. And the end result of it was him accepting it sooner than I was able to accept it. And I was humbled, really, because up until then, I had been one of these people who thought, well, it must take at least two years, you know or whatever um and and I, I i for quite a long time i was waiting waiting to see when he would you know show some symptoms of grief or break down or something like that and it never happened and i learned a lot and i still learn a lot obviously but i learned a lot from him in those in that first year probably about about the form that grief takes for different people. It's just different for different people and that's okay, you know? And that allowed me to be a bit kinder to myself as well. And that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting, yeah. It might have been uh, connected with um, character type, which yeah. you are. Hmm? Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm it, it would probably, you know, he's not a very an analytical kind of person, um, um, but uh, whereas I am, you know, and it would be very easy for me to um, go over the why and the why and the why. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's not helpful, really not helpful. Much better to just go, okay, it's happened, now what? You know, now what? Now what? And even now what can in the moment be let's just sit down and have a cup of tea, you know, or let me just cry and be crying and that be okay. Or for me, I was angry a lot of the time. So let me just stomp up and down the corridor and shout and be angry. And that's okay too. You know, lots of different reactions. Now that's great. Then if you can per uh, permit yourself to do that, allow yourself, because I'm still not, not really good in that. So Mm. Well, I did know, I think, one thing that I did know, I felt like I didn't know anything. I couldn't understand really what was going on at all. But one thing I did know was that it was, I, I needed to, if the emotions were there, I needed to just let them be there. So I wasn't doing things particularly to encourage anything. But I didn't try and shove anything away. And it did lead to a few awkward moments, I must say. <laughs> but I didn't care. I just didn't care anymore. Good. And that in itself was a relief. So I see that as a healthy thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. What I uh, experienced was a sort of a loss of sense of, of meaning in life. Oh, yeah. It was so uh, connected with him. We created these shows together and we were together practically all the time in the seven years we were together. Yeah. And that has had become the, the main um, 
content of my life. Yeah. And then uh, I realized when he was gone, uh, first of all, also, I still sometimes think it's not true. That's, mm. I'm still in this uh, area. And then I discovered that things I thought they were meaningful to me had sort of lost their meaning. Yeah. What shall I do, really? What shall I do with the rest of my life? It didn't... Yeah. Still, I'm a little bit in the seeking process. What am I really meant to do, you know? Before it was clear to be with him was uh, the, 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 the content, you know, and yeah. to develop our relationship and go deeper together in all sorts of ways. I mean, we were connected about integral theory, you know, we were talking about things the whole day, and now I don't have anybody to talk with about yeah. these things, you know, yeah. at least not on a daily continuous basis. And so the whole value system somehow went into tilt, into shock. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I recognize that because I say, again, the same thing happened for me. The things that I have, that had been very meaningful. For example, I used to do a lot of Teze singing, which is kind of like devotional chanting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would do it every morning maybe. And it was lovely. And after Philip died, I realized that it meant nothing to me. It had lost all its meaning. And actually that felt like another bereavement was not nice. And I was felt lost for quite a long time. Um, and, and my response to that was to up my, um, I became a bit obsessed, I think, in trying to find out uh, what happens when you die. Um, what is the point of being alive anyway? Because I, I know that I, I don't know if you feel like this, but I felt, I didn't exactly want to kill myself, but I certainly didn't really want to be alive. I couldn't see any point in being alive, you know? Mm, not quite like this. I still am clinging very much to life and I think I still have something to do, but I didn't see the point in life at that moment. And I yes. still am not really completely out of that. Yes. What, and the existential question, what is life about? You know, that came ever more, more pressing and I'm listening or reading stuff about that, but that's not, not, yeah, it's helpful, but it's more their own inquiry. What, what is this? You know, it's more a spiritual quest in, in, in many ways. You know, what, what, why are we here? You know, yeah. what, what is the, are we this, uh, probably we have to go backward in our self-esteem in the sense to, that we are really only this little part in, in bringing ahead evolution. Mm. We are not this big thing and it's not even probably Re re requested that we are do huge things in our lives but just go on keep yeah. being alive and do something which is helpful for for how do you say the ma maintenance of the species not only yeah. that but the evolve uh, evolution of the species you know but yes it's interesting that uh, one of the things that i was very very important for me and it still is important is that I needed to make sure that I was enjoying myself all the time. Now, I know that sounds a bit odd when I was in the middle of grieving and all the rest of it, but by that I meant that I couldn't, because, because you know, when somebody close to you dies, you can't help but have your own life be affected by it, of course, because they died. But um, it's like um, I understood that my life could suddenly go as well. You know? Exactly. And that I felt myself falling back into fears, which I thought I didn't have them anymore. Yeah. yeah. You know? And oh, when I will be in the same situation as Mark was, who will take care for me? Nobody, you know, and things like that. They came all like yeah. over me. It's a little better now. This, the question is not resolved. You know, I still don't know uh, if I ever would have somebody who is doing the same thing mm. for me, which I did for him. But it became so important. It's a sort of self-pity in some way, but maybe it's not so much pity. It's more, um, what is that? Yeah, fear. Fear generally of losing the dignity. 
Mm. Maybe, uh, you know, not being respected, being maybe in somewhere in a hospital and people treat you like a piece of meat or something, mm. which I really was very keen that Mark, uh, I defended him in the hospital, you know. Mm. Uh, so uh, when you can't defend yourself anymore and in some way uh, people deny your humanity yeah. and see you only as case and anyway you will die. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah yeah well I mean that's part of the work that I now do is encouraging people to plan ahead as best they possibly can for the outcome that they would want which of course means that you have to face up to death your own death and um, difficult as that may be now it's a lot better to do it now than to be incapable of doing it because you're not well enough or you're not thinking straight enough or whatever that is and yeah not not easy really not easy we should uh, create a sort of um, a group of uh, advocacy one for the other you yeah. know would be a good thing because yeah and and actually that's one of the things that i have i spoke about it in my recent book before i go um because there's a chapter in there called aging I think it's called Aging Without Children. And it's for people who either don't have any children or for some reason are, you know, they're not in their life or something like that. And, and, it, it, and it addresses this, you know, well, what are, you know, because we make the assumption that our adult children will look after us when we're old. And, but if there's nobody around, who's going to do it? So one of the suggestions in there is that you start now while we're still young relatively to create a community if you don't already have that of um it could be family members but they need to be um, a younger generation but it also incredibly important for me as well is um friends and um and talking about this kind of stuff with them so that there is some sense of reciprocity about what we might do for each other when, if we find ourselves in this kind of situation. And, and um, uh, honest uh, conversations about how we want to be looked after, what we're willing to accept or not willing to accept, this kind of thing. Because if we don't have immediate family who would do that for us, then we're going to we are going to be relying on friends so they they become our family if you like really important yeah that's yeah well it's hard it's hard it's like you know in, in just in that moment with that sigh it's like we can go down the route of oh my god this is all so depressing what are we going to do <laughs> or or we can take it as an invitation which is how I have dealt with it, to yeah. really be grateful for what we have now. So right now, it's like I can be grateful for just the fact that I'm alive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just the fact that I'm alive. Although there have been times when I would have preferred not to have been alive, put it that way. But, you know, it's a bit further away from Philip dying now, and um, I am now grateful. Um, yeah, that's true. I am now grateful. I, in fact, I spend a lot of time, much more time now, feeling grateful than I had ever done before. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. uh, it happens to me too, that I begin, I, I mean, I was grateful all the time, for the time I had with Mark, you know. Yeah. Uh, it Only it's difficult to remain grateful when then uh, it's gone. But um, it yeah. helped me a little bit because it was a good time and it was mm -hmm. a, a really... I, I got a lot from him, which I mm. never had thought to to get in, in my life. But I can now also understand uh, why people don't want to think about death. Mm -hmm. you know, because you enter into this panic, maybe, oh, what will happen with me? So it's better not to think about it. It's completely irrational and completely also, you know, yeah. childlike, uh, uh, not, not very adult. But I, I can understand why you people would like to prefer not to see it as a real yeah. future, you know, because it's too too upsetting. And in some way, it's also right, in my opinion, because if I I discovered myself always being uh, anxious about how, how the future will unfold, and that's not good too, 
no, because no. otherwise um, you will you don't live anymore it's it's yeah. you are overwhelmed with fear you know and that's not good so find the right that's what i'm trying to do now the right balance between uh, that uh, knowing that this mm -hmm. will come and but being open to life again, you know, and yeah. find refined meaning in some way, which I, in the, in the very base of my heart, I know that I haven't lost it, you know? Yeah. 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 And the surface, whoop, what yeah. is it, you know, so. That's very interesting because I think that was one of the things that I was exploring, particularly in the first couple of years after Philip died. And that's what I was, one of the things I was writing about in Gifted by Grief, my first book was the um oh i've forgotten my thread i've forgotten <laughs> i forgot what we were talking about what what did you just say there <laughs> you know what is curious that happened to me just about a few minutes before i thought do i really remember what i wanted to say <laughs> what is that yeah. That is oh. a message of the unconscious, isn't it? Oh, I know what it was. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the basic belief. It's the the underly, underlying belief. I, because that my underlying belief in what life was had been rocked so much by the end of it in this person who was my, you know, closest friend and all the rest of it. Um, it made me dig deeper, I think to discover um, what, like, the, it, there was a very vivid image for me, which was watching him dying, well, watching him taking what appeared to be his last breaths, I didn't know, and then suddenly there were no more breaths, and about, and, and he was just, you know, a body lying there on the bed, it didn't look like, it did look like him, it looked exactly like him, and yet it didn't look like him at all. And about three weeks later, when I was at home, I woke up one morning and I thought, well, if that body lying on the bed was, um, it was like an empty bag, you know, who he was had just left it and he'd left behind this empty bag. And I thought, well, what is this body? This body is a filled bag. I've got to find out what it's filled with. Now, you know, I've been a spiritual seeker all my life. I thought that I knew what this body was filled with. But I, I was clearly, I was being required by life to go a lot deeper. And I did become a bit obsessed with that, I would say. <laughs> but I had a quite a, a, a very interesting and challenging journey uh, to discover a, a much, much deeper and more um, all-inclusive sense of stillness, I would say, stillness and peace and unknowing that that was who I really was and that all this other stuff is just the personality, you know, um, and when I say just the personality, I don't mean it in a, in a facetious way, but just, but it's, it's, it's simply not so important as this underlying, um, life force, let's say. Um, and that was the difference. There was the life force flowing through me, this knowledge of this, sense of quietness and stillness and it simply wasn't flowing through philip's body anymore that was all that was the only difference but it it does it didn't it wasn't it hadn't disappeared it just wasn't coming through that particular channel i don't know if that makes sense does it it makes uh, totally sense and it leads to to something i want to share with you which is a little bit let's say awkward to share for people who think that um, these things don't exist Mm -hmm. uh, I just am listening. It's again the um, the sound of the um, I don't know the name of this bird. It says hoo hoo. Oh, hoo -hoo. the owl. The owl. The owl. The owl yeah. yeah. So I discovered the last few days that the owl was uh, um, uh, shouting. For instance, yesterday night, and no, I should uh, start somewhere else. I should start that when Mark had died and I went down to the river where we always went together, uh, there from that day on in 95% of the times there was a big crane about a meter high on the other, uh, or sometimes on the tree, sometimes on the other um, uh, rib, um, 
oh, I don't know English anymore, on the other uh, side of the river, sometimes yeah. a little further away. And I could only, when I made photos at, uh, with a long lens, I could see that it was him. But it was always there. And I connected that with Mark. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, it, it's magic and everything, but I think part of our life is uh, also uh, connected with mm -hmm. some other forces. So, and these uh, um, these birds are often uh, messengers considered, mm -hmm. I think, in shamanism and uh, considered messengers. I'm not really knowledgeable mm -hmm. about that, but I heard that they were messengers from the other side. So he was always there really almost always or oh, I just saw it fly away two or three times they were in two mm -hmm. and I thought oh that's his daughter who died five years before oh wow yeah and so and then from the beginning of this year right in January he wasn't there anymore and up to now this bird I haven't seen this bird anymore Gosh. now yesterday I was hearing the owl um, shout ooh, 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 all the time and then I realized, oh, maybe that's now the voice. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of him and the owl stopped. <laughs> for, the whole, for the whole time, I didn't hear it anymore before going to sleep and it was quite, uh, quite a while. And this morning, the same thing. It still was, I, it was six o'clock. It was uh, not yet really morning, but... I heard it uh, three or four times and I was thinking about it, talking with, with him, let's say, you know, and then it stopped. Mm. Interesting. So, yeah, you can think about it, what it is, what you want, you know, and I'm sort of reluctant as an intelligent person, which has a capacity of, <laughs> of, of rational thinking. And it was always so, De denied that these things could yeah. be part of life. But now I have uh, learned so much. I've learned from Rupert Sheldrake about the, the fields. And, you know, that's much more uh, in our universe than we can see and t yeah. touch and, and smell and things like that. So I allow myself to think that that might be him. And I feel connected. I feel, yeah. sort of, you know. Yeah, it's lovely. And I, I mean, I've had similar things, but not so much with animals, but just senses, you know, and I've learned to trust that and to, and to go with it. If I have, if I have a thought that is like, that's Philip, you know, or actually here's a, another one closer to hand, because last year my mum and dad died and my mum had in the pre, in the previous year, there had been a hedgehog in her garden visiting, but she'd hardly ever seen it. She'd seen it once and then for months and months hadn't seen it at all, but she was very keen to see it. And, um, but, but it just wasn't showing itself at all, no matter what she did. Anyway, um, she did die. And then about, uh, I think it was a week later, I was in the garden and I turned around and there in the middle of the grass is this hedgehog and it's just sitting there and I'm like a meter away from it not far away at all and I just thought that's mum and eventually it wanders away you know um, and I was telling my niece about this and she said the same thing she just looked at me and she said that was granny <laughs> <laughs> and it was like do you know what it whether that is the case or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that I'm willing to trust the thought that came and the fact that it brings me comfort. I really like that, you know. I like the fact that, yes, why not? Why might it not have been, um, you know, my mum showing herself in a different form or showing a sign that she was okay or... It doesn't really matter what it is. It is, it is. it is comforting. And I think that's really important that we find whatever brings us comfort. And different people have different things. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't say in, uh, for me, it's more like more igniting still the, the grief in many oh, ways. Right. Oh, it, it's, it's comfort on the same at the same moment. It's, yeah. You know, it's both. That's true, actually. That's true. Because when I realized this, I was in tears. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
you can it, there's a poignancy isn't it there's like and I actually I said this to my sister just the other day she's just been visiting so we were you know talking about my mum and dad it's only six months ago since they died and um I'm you know my mum had motor neurone disease so she would only have got much worse so at the same time I'm very glad that she died and she didn't have to suffer anymore and also, I'm incredibly sad that it happened and I didn't want it to happen. So how you can have sadness and gladness together, I don't know, but you definitely can. You definitely can. You, yeah, you have it. I mean, I have it. I had yeah. it and still have it. So that's, that's so many things to explore, no? which you didn't, you yeah. were not able to explore before. And so many beliefs or ideas you have before and then when reality comes, it's everything different. <laughs> no, it's amazing, isn't it? It's just, oh. So I, I don't know about you, but one thing that I found that was helpful was talking to other, for me, other women who had had their husband, who had lost their husbands. That was very helpful for me. Um, and I was lucky that I had one or two women around me that I could speak to like that. Has that been important for you? I, I created the show series, no, to have you and the people online to talk with me. Yeah. You know? So it was really important for yeah. me yeah. to learn how other people uh, handle that. Yeah. Also, the the reason why we talk now and uh, we we did the series that maybe somebody comes across the the public video and gets some. How can you say? Consolation is not the right word, but some information that you yeah. are not alone and that there is somebody who has gone through, maybe in a different way. But, you know, when you are only alone and have nobody to talk about it and nobody to hear from, in that case would be one-sided when somebody is watching us. But still, it is almost like a conversation because... Yeah you learn something from the other and you can try it on and see, is that for me or is it not? Yeah. And it's okay, that's not. But, you yeah. know, there's a variety. And in, in the series, you know, there came a huge variety of, of, I mean, the basic line is very similar, but then how everybody uh, uh, feels and handles might be a different. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that in itself demonstrates how grief shows up for different people in different ways at different times. And all of it is absolutely fine. And gosh, if there's, you know, I mean, if there's ever a lesson about staying open hearted to people and not making judgments and including them in your life, no matter what, it's got to be this, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Another thing what I, uh, what I realized that it is completely different thing to to separate from a partner because you know the partnership was not good and then they are gone and you don't know if they are alive or not. Yeah. But when you were in a close relationship and then the partner goes away in that way. Yeah. It's a completely different thing. I yeah. didn't know. And I I said to me, oh. Now you do the experience as a widow. Who has thought about that ever, you know? Mm, that's so, right. Well, I, did, I can remember I wrote a blog about it at the time. I, I can't remember the exact name, but it was something like about the, diff, the five differences between divorce and death of a partner, you know? And uh, yes, it is completely different. Um, in fact, I, oh, I can remember a, um, somebody, uh, uh, not a close friend, but a friend of mine who had gone through a divorce. This was maybe 18 months after Philip had died. And she was, it was a difficult time for her. And she said to me, um, I wish he had died. It would have made it easier. Now that, I felt that like a knife in my heart. It was really hard. I did understand why she was saying it and I didn't say anything, but goodness, that was painful because you can't compare the two. You simply can't. It just doesn't work. No, completely different thing. Exactly. It, they're both losses and they both have to be um, acknowledged as that. And I can understand somebody saying that, you know, because there's, when somebody dies, there is a public acknowledgement of that. And we don't have that for when somebody divorces, not unless you do, you deliberately do something like that. It, it, make sure that people know. But 
it doesn't work to compare. <laughs> no, it's when, when somebody dies, uh, this is the con combined what we talked already about with the existential questions of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, at least for most people it is. And, and uh, well, when you divorce, yeah, you know, it's divorce, but afterwards you are still, uh, yeah. you, you go your life and you say, oh, this uh, didn't work out and I do something else. Yeah. But it's not this absolute loss. It's not this cut. No. It is a cut. But yeah. it's not the same type of cut. Right? No, that's right. And, you know, we, you know, it, it, I think perhaps there's more room for an acceptance of divorce being a loss, you know, and, and all of that can bring, even if you want to get divorced. Um, but to hold the death of divorce at the same place doesn't, doesn't work, okay. even though there are two major losses. I have been divorced twice, so I have a certain comparison. <laughs> okay. no, that's good. The second time really uh, was very much, uh, um, how do you say, endure, enduring. And I should have divorced much earlier, but I didn't realize. Uh, and so it was really difficult and I really wanted to get away from this mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but it's just it's it was so also it was heavy because it, he was a borderline personality and he, he made hell to me mm -hmm. you know so it was really really difficult from this perspective yeah but yeah. it's a completely different thing it's painful but it's a different pain <laughs> exactly that's a really good way of putting it yeah a different pain i agree I mean, I've never been divorced, so I don't actually know, but, but you have, and you do know. <laughs> <laughs> I do, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I think the main difference is that after divorce, uh, life is not challenged in the same thing. Life yeah. in itself is not yeah. challenged. Life in but, itself, and that's really important because there's such a lot of mystery around death, you know, and even with people who have had near-death experiences or... Um, people or mediums you know who are able maybe to speak with people on the other side or whatever it's like um, nobody really knows for exactly for sure what is going to happen for them when they die um, no we can't so it's it is the unknown you know it just is the unknown and that's that's one of the things that human beings are not very good at dealing with is just living with the unknown <laughs> yeah and uh, also if somebody tells you uh, that's for them. The interiority of a person is individual. You cannot really share. When, when I say words, which is happening inside of me, and you might understand it in a completely different way, we, we have no real means to compare interior uh, experiences. We don't know. But even, you know, I see red in this way. Do you see it really in the same way? Yeah. We don't true. know. No, we don't know. And so how can we pretend to know uh, how death uh, will be when somebody is talking about their near-death experience? Probably their, my, their real death might come that way, maybe. Yeah. But yeah. that has nothing to tell us about ours. It might, no. might be no. not. but No, it's interesting, isn't it? Maybe it's the same thing as it was before when I was talking about comfort. You know, maybe it brings comfort, you know, to choose, like, like basic, for for a long time now I've believed about death that either it's either there's nothing and I won't know about it so it doesn't matter or there is something else that I'll be conscious of and my belief is is that that will be wonderful <laughs> I have no idea if that's true or not but I choose to believe that because it makes me feel good here now you know yeah and um, what I think and I try I think I try to do is in some way prepare for for this to become strong in a way which is not this strength it's a, a different strength to be able to to face that and to 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 go through it in a way that um how can i say i don't find words for that that the soul or whatever the essence is mm -hmm is not damaged but can can go go ahead in some way I yeah don't, i don't yeah. know how to say that it's really difficult it's not only to be uh, like mark was sort of heroic and uh, do everything 
uh, which you can for make life easier for the <clears throat> people around you. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, not to make hell to the people mm -hmm. around you. That's mm -hmm. one thing. But the other thing is really not to make hell to yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that's another thing. It's like faced with death, the essence of life is becomes really important. And as that plays out in the human form, kindness and self-care and self-love all becomes incredibly important. Much more so, or at least for me, much more so than before, I think. Or I understood it in a different way. I don't know. That's interesting because I had the last few days the insight that's exactly what I have to work on. Right. <laughs> you know, not to all the time you should and, you know, uh, uh, and uh, why don't you do blah, 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 but become more tolerant with myself and become more kind with myself. Yeah. Yeah. I know that a word that I've often used recently is uh, tenderness, treating myself with tenderness, you know. It's, I love that word. I used to hate it, but I love it now. <laughs> and I think about it, if I think about stroking a little kitten or something, I would be stroking it tenderly. And that's really how I want to be treating myself, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I, I came to the realization that's probably the next step of growth, which mm -hmm. I need to do. Oh. The, the, the kid, little kitten, I have a 15-year-old cat and I think he has decided... Oh. You know, or maybe not. I was at the vet yesterday again, and yeah, we will see. So death is still around the corner. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, yes. While we're alive, it's going to be around because it's part of life, isn't it? So yeah, but you know, you say it normally, but but when it comes and becomes reality, it's a different thing. <laughs> it is a different thing. I completely agree, and it's very humbling in that sense. Very humbling, and I suppose that's something that we can learn from. Um, and that it's good. It's always good to be learning. Obviously, learning and growing. But yeah, it's humbling. Yeah, and maybe that's a good place to stop here yeah, with our fine. conversation. Yeah. It's a life lesson and maybe one of the real serious ones, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One that we can treat with tenderness and with love and with kindness and, um, and ultimately maybe find some gratitude in, although possibly not at the beginning <laughs> yeah and find also some good um uh, attitude towards life itself yeah definitely definitely and you know when i said uh, at the beginning life changes when you face the end of it that is just the way it is you know it's how it changes is where we can um have some influence I think the fact that is that it changes and then how it's changing for us is where we can be influential and that's really in a way what we've been talking about yeah yeah so let's meet again in a year and see yeah, where we are absolutely that would be so interesting <laughs> oh my goodness yeah. Yeah, and I thank you very much to have been with me here. And it's that's pleasure. really so helpful to talk with somebody about these things. Yeah, I know. In their experiences, it's really good. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, and we see you again. Okay. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.